We'd like to welcome our worldwide radio audience to worship in your home, brought to you by www.churchofchristpreaching.com. Let's go to the Father in prayer, please. Dear Lord, one of your evangelists here on earth is reporting. Thank you, Father, and we praise you for all that you do at this congregation, your church. We pray that you'll uh, bless the report that we make to the church today. You're already witnesses of these things, and so we pray that you continue to bless us in the works that you would have us do. Defeat us in anything that we're doing of our own mind, and uh, save us, Father, and, and help us that we can continue to preach the cross of Christ in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I am a seven, I'm Kelly Lawson, a 73-year-old non-paid volunteer evangelist and servant of the Main Street Church of Christ. I don't sign checks at this church. I am a servant of this church. Eric Jenkins has been associate minister of the church for 18 years. I just want y'all to know that he's my right-hand man around here, and uh, I'm really glad to have him. Brother Eddie Frazier is our jail and prison chaplain, and Eddie uh, left here in 1998, and he has baptized almost 19,000 people in the Dallas County Jail and another jail unit. And so Eddie uh, got his training here, Eric got his training here, and there's some other people got their training here, and they're going on to do great works, and so we want to talk this morning about the work here. Thank y'all for coming up and, and being with us a minute, okay. brother. Thank All you right. very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to serve a wonderful brethren like this. Um, today our worship will consist of a report to the church, you, the congregation here, our supporting congregations, our 6,693 house churches throughout the world, and our very special radio audience an internet audience that worship with us in your homes uh, by radio and internet every Lord's Day. Main Street Church of Christ.com is becoming Church of Christ Preaching.com. You'll be able to find us on the internet either way. We have a uh, audio library that's got every sermon that I preached for the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years on there. It's uh, got video sermons for about a year. It's hooked up to YouTube. You have to wait a minute till that page loads. And we've got written lessons, thousands of written lessons on there. Our goal in 2017 is to expand our worldwide radio broadcast to 24 hours a day. I'd like to tell you a little bit about radio broadcasting. We have found a better way the uh, uh, people like Radio Madagascar, you know we were gonna get on Radio Madagascar, but governments get involved in that stuff and they ruin it. And so what happened is that the government, Madagascar, got, got greedy. So this Church of Christ outfit spent eight million dollars building this radio station over on Madagascar. And instead, we don't have to do that, we can just buy that time. And we can buy that time pretty cheap. For $200 a week, we can do two broadcasts that cover the entire earth. So for $200 a week, we can cover the entire earth once. And uh, that's a whole lot cheaper than an $8 million capital investment in building a bunch of radio stations that you don't know whether the government's going to take them over or not. We just hire that time on the radio. Uh, we're going to use the bully pulpit and the internet this, this year to uh, challenge and to try to make 100,000 evangelists in house churches throughout the world. We're going to turn loose a bunch of Kellys on the entire world if they're going to go out there and do exactly what we've done here. I want to challenge you this morning to dream the impossible dream to reach for the stars, that there's nothing too hard and nothing above what we can do. If we establish 100,000 house churches, 
it's very easy to do. If those houses will do the same thing that Jesus told them to do, go out and bring in the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. We got Lomax here this morning, blind man. We've got all kinds of lame people here. We've got all kinds of halt people here. We started inviting the poor and God supplies the money. Every sermon I've preached since 2006 has been on this, uh, is on this uh, uh, website of ours. I'm an evangelist. There are not many evangelists. There's a whole lot of preachers, but there's not many evangelists. Paul told Titus in Titus 1.5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting. So in the first job of an evangelist is to set in order the things that are wanting in a church and ordain elders in every city as I've appointed thee. Well, I haven't been able to get past that set in order of the things that are wanting because there's so much right here that's wanting that need to be set in order. I haven't been able to get it past that, and we don't have people here that's qualified to be elders, but I'm far too smart to be the pope of this place. So I'm going to talk today and next Sunday about how I have managed to uh, subject myself to the congregation and to, uh, uh, to uh, run a successful church. And the, the problem that we face here is how to take a 19th century church, this church here was formed in 1896, how to take a 19th century church into the 21st century. How are we going to do that? using first century technology called the Bible. And so it's a real hard act to follow. I want to give you warning about uh, William and that, that it's not an easy job. In uh, 2 Timothy 4, 5, Paul told Timothy, but watch thou in things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So Eric Jenkins, and uh, would you come up, William, and you too, uh, Vito? Would y'all come up a minute? Uh, Eric Jenkins is our associate minister here, and I have tried to get these two young men that I'm going to introduce you to. Uh, I'm trying to get these two men to throw in with us, and I'm going to tell you a little about them. William, I'm very proud of him. He's a Bible major at Harding University. He graduated from our four-year program a uh, year and a half ago or so. Yes, sir. And then he's gone now, and he's an honorable young man, and he's gone and, and worked for a year and paid down his college debt because he didn't want to leave it for his mother and dad. And I've told him that we don't have any money here, and he doesn't care a lot about money, but he needs a little money. And so we're going to have to try to raise him a little money. And I've offered to move him in my house, or he can move in Paul's house, or we'll have to get him an apartment if he prefers that. But I've told him that we'll give him room and board and pay a little on his college debt over a week and uh, give him a little pocket money. And so we have, uh, we've offered to, to, uh, to, to help him all we can and try to raise a little support for him because he has a right to have a house and home and a family and sometimes in the future. And with the understanding that as his church builds that he'd have a right to, to a greater and greater pay. Just because I don't take any pay at all doesn't mean that preachers don't deserve pay because the Bible teaches that they do deserve pay and don't muzzle the ox while he works in the threshing floor, right? And so Vito is our truck driver evangelist, and he's a student preacher. He's going to Bible college, and he heard us driving through Nashville, Tennessee. He heard us on the radio, and he uh, sent, and he got CDs from us, and uh, uh, he uh, owns his own truck, and uh, he got CDs, and he came down here, and he studied with me over a week or two, and was baptized into Christ after finding the more excellent way. And then we started signing him up in Bible studies and he's completed some of those. And now we've got him signed up in college and he's completed his first college course and got an A plus on it. He left here last Sunday and last Monday night, a train hit his truck and wiped him out. It cost him a quarter of a million dollar truck and uh, uh, 
uh, he's, he's hurt, he's been busted around, and, and uh, the train uh, was defective, and so we've lawyered him up. We've got him uh, lawyered up with Calhoun, the lawyer, and uh, uh, he's going to be all right. They're going to protect him for his rights. The arm didn't come down at the crossing, and it's just wiped him out. It's wiped his money out and everything, and he's been giving us $200 a week and paying for two of those international radio broadcasts, and he can't do that anymore, that uh, he's lost his living. So we need to pray about that and pray for these two men that we'll be able to bring them on board, and I want to introduce them to you. So thank y'all, guys. Thank y'all. I have, uh, I've told William that uh, the little amount that we paid him, he's almost like an indentured servant. And if he wanted to go all the way that we'd take him and notch his ear into the, the uh, doorpost with an awl and he could be a lifetime slave and, and we'd go on and just pay that college off. And uh, he wouldn't have to worry about a thing, but he thinks he wants probably to lean more towards the, the temporary payments rather than the one full payment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great that we don't live under the law of Moses? See, that's what they told you to do in Deuteronomy 15, about verse 16. In Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. We need to have a vision. We need to look above what we can possibly do. I take the Great Commission serious. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I think it is a commission given to every evangelist, to every preacher in the entire world. Every person ought to have a world view. And I want to talk to you a minute about how you view things. Years ago, I was a businessman, and I had a speed reading program. And I took my employees out to lunch at Youngblood's Cafeteria at uh, Forest Lane and, uh, and Marsh, I believe it was. And right across the street was uh, an insurance agency. And so as we pulled up to Youngblood's just prior to noon, that insurance agency started letting out. And I said, let's hurry and get in here and get our lunch, man, before this insurance agency lets out. And so we beat all them people in there, and we went in, and we ate, and we came back to the we came back to the the uh, uh, we came back to the the office, and I called a guy in who was just selling one on one, and he's making about the equivalent of a hundred or two a week. And I said, did you see all those people coming in that insurance company today, at, out of that insurance company today at noon? He said, I sure did. I said, that give you any idea? And he said, yeah. He said, I could find out who those people are, and I could go by their house, and I could sell them this speed reading course. And I said, I believe you can do it. And I called another guy in, and he's making more money. He's making about 500 a week. And I asked him, I said, you see all those people coming out of that insurance company today this noon? He said, I sure did. I said, that give you any idea? He said, I noticed that they ate in groups. He said, if I can get in there and get in there one of their lunch groups, I can sell these, these speed reading courses four and five at a time. And I said, I believe you can do it. And I called the other guy in. And as he came in the office, he said, I just got through talking to that insurance company. He said, I'm going out to see them. And as soon as they hear what this speed reading course will do, they'll buy it for all their employees. Now, everybody saw the same thing. But one person, all they could see was just a little bit. And another person had a bigger vision, and they could see more. And the other guy had unlimited vision, and he could imagine it all. I want you to step up. We need to step up this coming year. And we need to put in practice this verse. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Our 2017 radio goal, that we want to get on the radio 24 hours a day on Sunday. 
and our website and, and uh, social media. We need to use the bully pulpit of the radio that's going out to the entire world and the internet and social media. We need to get up to speed on that. And Joe is, is one of our employees that's going to help us on that, on this social media stuff, and I hope that William will too. Uh, we want to establish 100,000 evangelists and house churches all over the world. And for those that are in the United States, we have a curriculum right here for you. We have a curriculum, and this curriculum right here is the beginning of a college course that, that this college course would make any evangelist in his home, he'd be prepared to go and to be an evangelist and to be a teacher and to have a house church and had teach sound doctrine right here with this one package. So for those people who can afford it, for about $50, we'll send you for cost, postage and everything, we'll send you the college level books and the stuff that it takes to uh, become a, uh, a evangelist and to have a house church. For those people who want to begin, we're going to send you first the book that I wrote back in 1990 called The Sea, and we'll send this book to anybody who's interested in this in the United States, and when you finish this course, we'll send them to you one at a time if you can't pay for them. We'll give you a scholarship and send them to you one at a time, and if you can pay for them, we'll send them to you all at one time. And through, for people throughout the world, they can go on the website and start taking these courses on the website. As I said, I'm an evangelist, and all my life has really been in training to do the things that I'm doing right now. I used to think that it takes a great man. And I know some of you think that it takes a great man to do a job like this. But I want to tell you that there's really no such thing as great men. There's only great challenges that ordinary men like you and I have to face and that we have to overcome. There's no such thing as great men. So get that out of your head. Every one of you has an opportunity to be great for Christ if you'll just take care of the challenges. Again, this is a report of my ministry. 23 years ago, my wife had been in the hospital nine times, and she was down to 80 pounds when I came to this church. I'd had two heart attacks trying to take care of her and run an environmental engineering company. I was doing about a million a year in sales, and I went broke trying to take care of her and her hospital bills and my hospital bills. And I came and sat on this back row right back here at the back, and all I wanted to do was go to heaven. This I just came to peak in east side to go to heaven. Being the prodigal son of this congregation and the greatest of sinners, I've really never thought that I was worthy to be the minister of the Main Street Church of Christ. Prior to 23 years ago, everything I've done in my life has been a failure in one way or another, and is there's just nothing that doesn't bring me shame about my past, and there's nothing that I can do to correct it other than repent, which I do daily. The truth is, again, is that I've failed at everything that I've done in life. I spent nine and a half years in prison, mainly in the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, for uh, uh, multiple bank robberies, organized crime, weapons violations. And so that's one part of me. But I'm kind of a complex person on the other side. I was a very successful businessman. I owned many bars and clubs and restaurants and, and grocery stores and liquor stores and, and just the President's Task Force on Organized Crime in 1968 decided that I wasn't just an innocent bar owner and produce farmer, that uh, uh, all them trucks that I had running from Piedras and Adres was doing other things. And so they, uh, they raided all my businesses and took everything that I owned, and, and uh, I robbed a bank because I didn't want to leave town without any money. And that's when I found out, <laughs> that's when I found out the federal government doesn't know how to take a joke. <laughs> uh, they do not know how to take a joke, and no matter how bad you are, they have a place for you. And what they do is that they give you a category, one through six, 
and based upon how bad you are, that's where you go to. If you're a punk, you go to level one, and if you're a bad, tough, tough guy, you go to level six. And so they sent me to level six, seven, and, uh, and I found out that, that the government puts you in with people just like yourself, where everybody's a killer. And so it's a, it's, it's a lifestyle that, that I, would, I would advise you to abstain from. On the other hand, I have taught and personally baptized over 5,000 people since I became a Christian. I have discipled a lot of people. Not many professors at Harding have discipled 5,000 people. I must know something about it. I must have some practice. I have done it everywhere I've ever been since I became a Christian 40 years ago. Well, some of you might say, yeah, but 40 years ago you fell on your face, Kelly. You really goofed and fouled up, and you're a defrock preacher. Well, that's the truth. So was Moses. Moses was a defrock preacher, and he had to go away for 40 years. So you might say that I'm a defrock twice saved preacher. And uh, is there anybody in the room that doesn't believe in repentance? that we can't repent, good, I'm glad. So I hope that y'all will accept my repentance. I want to continue to every day to formally repent of my sins. Before I croak, I want to justify by this report uh, to this congregation, my office of evangelist here for the last 23 years. I'll talk more next week about what some of our plans are. Authority, is, uh, the only authority that we have in the world is scripture. And you, the church, set me apart as an evangelist. When you set me apart as an evangelist, the vote was about 97 to 3. Three people didn't believe that an ex-bank robber that's willing to come here and work for nothing is uh, for real. And they stood right, right here in front and uh, stood against me. And I took the old mafia saying that you keep your friends close and your enemies closer, and I brought the lady in and made her my secretary, May Roseboro. And May Roseboro was a fine secretary, and she didn't have to write checks around this, this church. For about six months, she was totally convinced that we were on the up and up 100% square, and that, uh, uh, she had fallen in among the right people. Diane Van Hooser is now our secretary. She's been a member of this church for 40 years. I don't sign on the bank account. The money is counted back there when I'm up here preaching. I don't handle the money. Diane Van Hooser writes checks. Vicki writes checks. Fred's wife, she's uh, uh, one of our secretaries. We've got two secretaries. Fred, here's our van driver. And maintenance man, how long have you been sober, Fred? Thirteen years. Thirteen years he's been sober. And we brought him in right here in, in our program. Um, Larry Thomas is our kitchen manager. He's back in the back. Big Larry has been sober 13 years too, right, Larry? And uh, he's, uh, he's in charge of our kitchen. He lives in church housing. And uh, he supports his own self. He gets no pay. He's our kitchen manager. John is still homeless. John works for us in the kitchen. He comes down here and volunteers every day because he knows that we're for real and that we uh, uh, take care of the poor and that we care about the poor here. Truck is one of our bouncers. Well, let's call him an usher, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Let's call him an usher. Uh, Truck is one of the most important people here. Truck was on the street all of his life. And Truck found a place that's heaven on earth that they really love the poor. And Truck is no longer on the street. He rides a bus over here every week. We give him a bus pass from his sister's house. We give him a bus pass. And he manages the, uh, the comings and goings here of the, of the church. And I told the police officer, we have a police officer here, I told the police officer, I said, if you ever see some guy kissing the concrete, the floor, 
and truck standing over him, put the cuffs on the guy on the floor. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the truck. And, and Steve is another one of our uh, 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 ushers around here. Steve used to be a boxer. I call him Knuckles. He'll, uh, he's ready to go anytime he ever has to go. And of course, we're really nonviolent around here. There's no problems. We have no problems. And the reason we have no problems is that we've converted people right here in our own neighborhood. These are the people in the hood. We live in the hood down here. These are people in the hood that really know we're for real and they want to be a part of this thing. Rick is our janitor. He's, uh, he's no longer homeless. And so uh, we've got a, a nice crew around here that uh, is a smooth running machine. Um, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I call heaven and earth to witness this day that I've done my best to follow the following scriptures uh, in dealing with y'all over the last 23 years in this, this ministry. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you not with excellency of speech and wisdom, Paul was probably one of the most highly educated people on the face of the earth. But instead of writing in classical Greek, the New Testament, he wrote in Keone Greek, the Greek of the marketplace. And I speak in the English of the marketplace, the language of the city, the, the, the market, the city, the people. People can understand me all over the world because I don't pay attention to fancy rules of grammar and use double negatives and a lot of things that I know better than, but it has nothing to do with plain speech. People deserve plain speech. And Paul said that he gave them plain speech. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech and wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I was determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you've got a salvation message from me every Sunday. No matter what I taught on, it ended up in being a salvation message where people can hear and become Christians. In Acts chapter 20, verse 26, where he called the elders of the church at Ephesus together, he says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the, all the counsel of God. And I feel the same way, for I've preached the Bible to you. In Acts 20, verse 33, I've coveted no man's gold or silver or apparel, and again, I want to tell you, I don't even sign on the checkbook here. I'm too fat. I've got more than what I deserve. I don't need any more. You pay my expenses, and that's all I need. And I drive a 1995 Buick. But I did buy some socks. I no longer have holes in my socks. I bought three, I bought three pair of socks, so, so I'm fixed up there. Uh, in Acts 20, verse 34, Paul says, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and them that were with me. And I have showed you in all things that in so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. All true evangelists take serious our marching art. Our marching orders are very plain. They're found in the Great Commission. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If every evangelist had a worldview, they'd teach the people that are right there with them, plus they have the opportunity to teach the whole wide world if they can figure out a way to do that. And of course, we've done that, hadn't we? When you start looking for the stars, you start reaching at least the moon. Two blondes was sitting down on the beach up in, in New Jersey and a reporter come up and, and asked them, said, is it true that blondes are really sharp? And they said, you bet we sure are. And they said, well, we've got one question for you. What's the, the, the closest distance is it to the moon or to Florida? And one of them said, duh, how stupid can you be? You can see the moon.
Well, we can see the moon, guys. We really can, and we can drain the impossible dream. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everything written in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus is instructions for people like Eric and Vito and, and William and I. It's instructions for an evangelist. That's what we're to do. All the things that are found in those books. In 2nd Timothy 2.2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul, first generation, among many witnesses, Timothy, second generation, the same. Not something different. I want you to notice that. The same. The very same thing. Not something new. Not keeping up with the times. The same thing. Commit thou to faithful men, third generation, which will be able to teach others also, fourth generation. Paul envisioned a Christianity that would not change but would go on. That's what Paul envisioned, and that's what I envisioned for you a Christianity that's just exactly like the first century. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul, speaking to Timothy, says that from a child I was raised in the church, and this same thing is true of me, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures that are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, Theopopneustos, God breathed, God breathed these scriptures out of the, the prophet. God breathed it out of the apostle. It is the very breath of God, the word of God. All scripture is given by the inspiration, the breath of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, all good works. You can do that with the Bible. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, the foremost work of an evangelist. Be instant in season and out of season, when you feel like it and when you don't. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come and they will not endure sound doctrine. That's happening right now today in the churches of Christ. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears that will tell them what they want to hear instead of the truth. And they shall be turned away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables, tales of supernatural happenings. But watch thou in all things endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, Make full proof of thy ministry. Many thought that we wouldn't make it six weeks, much less six months or six years or whatever. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, I've tried to make this a part of our uh, ministry here. If at all possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Don't whoop them unless you have to, unless they make you whoop them. Live peaceably with all men. Try not to be fighting and fussing. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now the important part. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou wilt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. I always thought that that verse that said, If thy enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. And you heap coals of fire upon his head. I always thought that what that meant was that if you do that, and you're good to people that are bad people, that, that God will get them if they act up. But that's not what it's teaching. That word is a word that's used, heaping coals of fire upon their head, is a word that's used to describe the smelting of ore. So there's a poem, if I can remember it, I'm not prepared with it this morning, but maybe I can remember it from the 17th century, an unknown author, says, and as the artist smelts the sullen ore of lead by heaping coals of fire upon its head, in a gentle warmth, 
the metal learns to glow, and pure and free from dross, the silver runs below. That's exactly what we're doing. We're refining. This is like an old gold mine or an old silver mine. It's all worked out, and there's nothing here but low-grade ore. And so we're out here working this low-grade ore, and we're working it constantly. And so if you take this ore and you beat it up with a hammer and you with the Word of God and you put it in a crucible in a fire, God's building a fire under them. The grace of God's working on them. He's worked on you for 35 years, hasn't he, Vernon? For 35 years, I baptized this guy in 1980 in the county jail. For 35 years, he's struggled. This is the whole point. Don't give up struggling. Don't stop fighting. Don't give up. The devil wins around, knocks you down. Get back up and go back to boxing, man. Don't crawl out with your tail between your legs. Be a man. Be a woman. Stand up to the, to the devil, man. Twenty-three years ago, Bernie Wood, wherever he's at, Bernie Wood, Fred Vaughn and I looked out among our neighborhood, and we saw all the homeless out there. And we said, well, they're not all hostile. Let's feed them. Let's feed them something. So we started feeding people. Started feeding 10, 20 people. Now it's grown up to 3,000 people a week that we feed. And so all of that is what the Lord tells us to do. In Matthew 25, 35, he says, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And then we added jail chaplains like Eddie Frazier and, and hospital chaplains like Bernie Woods and Vicki are hospital chaplains. And, of course, the Bible tells us about that, too, in Matthew 25, verse 36. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick or in the hospital, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So Eddie fulfills that. Burnett fulfills that. This church is fulfilling that every week. We have a worldwide missionary, Paul. He's going to be up here reporting to you in the next couple of weeks about his last trip. He went on to Turkey anyway. He went to Turkey, Greece, and Bulgaria, and so he'll be telling us about that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but the greatest part of the story is our goal for 2017. We uh, intend to use our pulpit to uh, establish 100,000 evangelists and 100,000 house churches, and we want you and your houses throughout the whole world to do like Jesus said. Just go out and bring in the poor and the maimed, the halt and the blind, and start teaching them, and God will supply everything that you need. 23 years ago, I was out of duty, and I walked the aisle here at the church. I confessed my sins and dedicated what was left of my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother W.O. Scoggins was an elder here. He'd been an elder for over 50 years, and he encouraged me to preach and teach again. He didn't care that my name was Mud. He didn't care about that at all, about me being a defrocked preacher. He just had that unique ability to look beyond what I was, and he could see all that I could become in Christ Jesus. I found a church that was out of order, in which a bully and his disciples was running everything around here. Uh, I caught a guy that, that had a hold of Brother Scoggins, an 81-year-old man jerking him around by his, his shirt and his tie. And uh, I warned him about it and got between them the first time. And the second time, I chastised him severely. I chastised him from the sidewalk right out here to the back right out here to East Side Street. And the last time I chastised him in East Side Street, I told him that the only way he was going to come back is walk the aisle and do no more of that. And I came and told the church the next Sunday morning. I said, I'm really sorry that I didn't handle that right, that uh, Jesus would have handled that different when I chastised that fellow the other night. 
Uh, but I promise you that if I ever catch any of you got your hands on an 80-year-old man, I'm going to chastise you the same way as I did him. And uh, I've only had to walk the aisle one other time over having chastised people around here. So I've been here 23 years and I only had two fights, so I, I'm doing pretty good for a guy like me. <laughs> When I first became the minister here, the last administration left, there's about 40 of us left, and we immediately found ourselves under lawsuit um, for $120,000 in which ungodly men were suing us based on a flim flam scam. I'll tell you more about it next week. We got more time. Uh, comp uh, that was started by the previous administration in which they leased a computer and a copy machine for $1,000 a month for, for five years. $60,000 a piece, you can buy a computer for $500 back in them days, and they leased one for $1,000 a, uh, a, a month for, for, 60 year, for five years, $60,000. Times two, times computer, times a copy machine, $120,000. We were under suit for $120,000 and um, uh, had no lawyer, had no money. They'd stole all the money. We found the checks to where they stole way over $100,000. They wrote checks to themselves for $40,500, $10,000, $7,500, $2,000, The first thing I did, I'm gonna come back to it in a minute, when Adair Chapman, uh, resigned was go get the front and back of, uh, of every check. So I went over here to a big fancy church, a big rich church, a church of Christ over here that our forefathers from this church had helped establish that church. And I went over there and I, I asked them, I said, listen, brethren, the guy that you sent over there to be an elder to help us turned out to be a thief and he stole all the money and he's got a suit for $120,000. Will you help us? Will you help us hire a lawyer? Now I have to admit that my reputation had probably preceded me over there. They had heard as a matter of gossip what type of person I'd been in the, in the past about making unlawful withdrawals from banks and things of that nature. <laughs> and uh, so they didn't want anything to do with anything that smelt like that. And so they said they'd have a meeting and they told me the next day, no, we're not gonna do anything at all. And they're building a huge fancy building. There's a thousand of them over there. They're building a huge fancy building. And I went outside and sit in the car and I cried. One of the last times that I cried, I cried over Ginger the other day and, and I do weeping every day in my heart. I just don't weep out openly, but I cried. And I said, God, I am not going to go around and beg at churches for money. You're going to have to send the money, and I'm going to preach the gospel and feed the poor. That coming Sunday, a stranger showed up here wearing bib coveralls, blue jean bib coveralls, and caught me in the lobby, and he said, can you give me a receipt for my contribution. And I said, well, I guess I can. And he said, well, I'd like a receipt for our contribute for my contribution. And he gave me $10,000 in $100 bills. You was there, Bernie Wood. You were there, you know about it. He came back the next Sunday and he gave me $5,000. Now, it wasn't quite 10,000, it was 9,000 something and it was uh, 5,000 next, but it rounded off, it was that. Uh, you, you think that was a miracle? See, some people would criticize me. They'd say, oh, now you believe in miracles, preacher. Well, I think it's as plain as the nose on your face that God did it. Amen. God did it. Amen. And one of the prerequisites to be a preacher is that in Hebrews 11:6, it says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. You've got to believe that there's really a God out there. 
And if there's really a God, he's really interested in the things that we do and what we do down here on earth, and he's able to overcome everything. And so I believe that. I believe if he wasn't a heavenly angel, he was certainly a messenger, and that's the meaning of the word, messenger or sin. We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. You'll be able to reach us according to MainStreet-ChurchOfChrist.com or ChurchOfChristPreaching.com. We're slowly going to be using both names and we're going to be converting into ChurchOfChristPreaching.com. Well, when we got a little money, I immediately sought counsel from Brother Adair Chapman, his widow is sitting here today. Um, I went to the White Rock preacher in eldership and asked their, their counsel and their guidance. And so they looked at our situation and us being under lawsuit and so forth. And uh, I called my friend Jack Keller, an old gangster that I knew here in town, the Hamburger King. I called him and I said, I need a bulldog fighting lawyer, man. I need a lawyer. This is not a job for the meek and the mild. I need a bulldog fighting lawyer. And so he gave me his lawyer and we hired the very best lawyer. And, uh, uh, and so we countersued these people that were suing us. And uh, the White Rock uh, preacher and eldership, they had an idea. They said, well, here's what you could do. You could give the property to us, and we'd release it back to you, and uh, 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 we could save the property that way. And I said, well, David, what will happen 20 years from now when you're not the preacher here anymore and there's a different group of men that are elders? What will happen then? And he said, well, he said, we can't speak for that. And I said, well, I think that we'll just go on and protect it our own selves here for a while. Uh, no, thank you. And so we hired Hal Maxwell, attorney at law. We countersued these people. And Adair Chapman saved this church. He got in here, and there was one bad elder left, and, and Adair Chapman, a good elder. And he met us right back here in the back. He met me and the, and the other elder back here in the back. And he called us in the office. He said, I'm going down to front in just a minute and I'm gonna resign as elder in order to throw us in congregational government. And the other guy, the thief, he says, no, 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 I said, wait, let me get another elder in here. And Adair said, no, I'm doing it so you can't get another elder in here. And so he came down here and resigned in front of the church and he saved this church, Nancy. He, uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. And Jan will always love you and and respect y'all for, for what your daddy did in saving this place. And uh, that allowed me to go get a copy of the front and back of all the checks for the last six months. That's where I found that all these people had stole all this money. So it takes a thief to catch a thief, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, 23 years ago, there was bunch of seniors here. I tried to love them all. I visited them in the hospital and the nursing homes and in their homes. I tried to protect them, and which was a big job because there's always a wolf out and uh, serve them with the very best of my ability. I have a dog in this hunt because my family came here in 1903 from Tennessee on a covered wagon both the Kelly family and the Lawson family and my grandparents became members of this church in 1903. My parents were married here in 1928 and I was born here in 1944. So I have a history of this church and I have a dog in this hunt and I intend for it to, uh, to be successful. In the last 23 years, we've maintained a church here in the middle of the hood. Uh, dedicating ourselves to preaching the, the gospel to the whole wide world and uh, feeding the poor. Um, we have developed our radio broadcasts are now going out. If you got the national radio broadcast you can put up there, that shows you, this shows you where the world's population is. Most of it in, in uh, 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 southern Mediterranean through the China is where four and a half billion of, of the world's population is. 
in the United States were broadcasting all the North Texas, West Texas, Abilene, Oklahoma, and Nashville. And that national station up there covers a whole lot more than that. It gets into Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and Kentucky. Uh, our first radio broadcast goes out from uh, Worldwide Christian Radio and covers about five billion people. It covers the entire Earth except part of Russia and China and uh, the Pacific. Our second broadcast covers all the area that we missed and doubles back on much of it. It covers about three billion people covering all of China, India, Russia, and all of the Pacific. Our third broadcast covers Europe, uh, Africa, uh, India. We've got about three billion people in that radio broadcast. Our fourth broadcast is to all of North America. Our fifth broadcast is to South America. Our sixth broadcast, again, is over the North Pole from Miami to all of the Pacific. Our seventh broadcast, again, is to all the Pacific, China, India, and all the Pacific. Broadcast 8, 9, and 10 goes out to Radio Africa that covers the entire Africa, all 21 English-speaking countries. On December 6 last year, we were going from those 10 broadcasts, which are in the morning, we were adding 10 more broadcasts in the afternoon in which uh, we had been told, don't worry about a thing, uh, we'll pay for that. And so people stepped forward and, and agreed to pay for those radio broadcasts. And we were going from 10 to 20 broadcasts. We're really up to 21 broadcasts now. And on December 6th was the day that that was to happen. And we had sent in our masters to the radio stations and everything. And lo and behold, that morning my wife got sick. And I took her by ambulance to, uh, to Baylor Hospital. And she uh, caught... Uh, uh, a super virus and later killed her, as you well know. When I got here to preach that morning, rats had eat the microphone cards and, and uh, speaker wires, and we had no speaker, but my lapel mic broadcast back there to the transmitter, so we got a tape of it, and I'm used to preaching to the back row anyway, so you didn't have any problem hearing me. Downstairs, rats had run amok and, and destroyed our, all of our back stock. Over years, we had saved and pinched pennies to get ahead on paper plates and cups and bowls and spoons. And rats run amok and destroyed about $3,000 worth of our back stock downstairs. Now, let me ask you seriously, what power is there on earth that can murder an evangelist's wife can have rats eat speaker and microphone cords and rats destroy food for the poor. What power is there on earth that can do that on the day that you go from 10 radio broadcasts to 20, just as obvious as God did it when he sent the money here to save this place, the devil did that in order to destroy this place, to try to destroy this place. Well, we're gonna pug his nose. All those that I've sinned against in life, I ask you to forgive me. I'm going on to greater, grander heights. We're going to preach the gospel to the entire world as long as I have breath. I'm going to train preachers, and we're going to conquer the earth with nothing. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Where there is faith, they will be evidence... There'll be evidence that it's working. It will succeed, and we are extremely successful, and we're not broke, we're just broke. We've done so much for so long with so little that we're now qualified to do anything with nothing. <laughs> so just watch. That's the creative power of the universe, doing things with nothing. That's what God does. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe that gospel, there's no reason whatsoever for you to be lost. You can put your faith and your trust and your confidence in God to save you. You can repent of your sins, turn from sin, and you can put on Christ and baptize. You can repent, 
and be baptized into Christ this morning and have all your sins washed away. If you have sin in your life, you need the help of the church or the prayers of the church. You want to talk to us about anything, won't you come now while we stand and sing? Oh, God.